This message entitled Two Sides of the Same Coin was delivered to Christ Our Rock Bible Church on April 22, 2018 by the Rev. Roy D. Warren, Jr. The scripture reference is Mark 16, 14. Mark chapter 16, verse 14. We've already been in the verses prior to it and we will continue to be in the verses afterwards as well. So it's Mark 16, verse 14. 14. Hallelujah. Afterward, he peered unto the eleven as they sat at meat and embraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Story in and of itself, isn't it, when you think about it? Amen? Just one verse. Just one verse. It tells... An interesting story. Two sides of the same coin. Father, once again, we just want your presence. Not just to be here, for we know you've already promised that. We want to know for a fact, dear God, that your presence is within our hearts here today. And you are giving the truth. You are giving the truth. And I pray, dear God, there would be many people come to know that that is indeed the case. That this is the truth of your holy word. I know sometimes it's hard for us to believe. We've been in chapter 16. We're going to continue in chapter 16. And time after time after time after time, nobody believes. Nobody believes. In fact, I've heard this chapter called the chapter of unbelief. Ironic that some suggest that these last several verses of this chapter were not original. (laughs) Now Lord, I don't believe that for a minute. I, I do believe, dear God, that this is Mark still writing, praise God, and therefore led of the Holy Spirit, praise God, and therefore it is your holy, infallible truth. They did not believe at first. Praise the name of Jesus. But praise God, you got a hold of their heart, you changed them in this way, and they came into true belief. I want to pray that for a lot of people, dear God. There are a lot of people, Lord, in this world. A lot of people, dear God, that are just looking for their own understanding on the things of God. And, Lord, that's that's unbelief, really. Because it doesn't matter what we want or what we think. It's what you say. And if we'll just believe what you have to say then we skip over that unbelief altogether. And I want to thank you for that. And I thank you, Lord, that even as we have been in unbelief at different times, maybe there's an aspect of a story we didn't believe. Maybe there's the um, the outcome of something and we have a hard time believing it. And so we say, well, I don't think it really happened like that. Lord, that's unbelief. And I want to thank you, dear God, that you are so merciful and so gracious that you will take us out of that. And you are willing to take others out of it too, if they'll just surrender. Praise the name of Jesus. So Lord, that's what we want today. That's what I know you're looking to give. That's what I know you want to give. To take away the unbelief and replace it with true belief. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. The two sides of the same coin. Two sides of the same coin. Pastor Dennis Fakes, um, I've quoted him before, he's the pastor, or he was the pastor, at least at the time of the writing of his of the, the book that I have that he wrote, he was pastor at a uh, Divinity Lutheran Church um, in uh, Oregon, Ohio, 
You know where that is? Over by Toledo? You know. Um, I don't know if he's still there, but anyway, he was. Um, and he tells this story. He says, there's a man in my congregation who is extremely proud of his hunting abilities, especially his markmanship. Never missed. Never missed. I went hunting with this proud hunter once. Watch this, he instructed, as a passing duck flew overhead. He fired at it, and the duck kept on flying, as if nothing had happened. Pastor, said the hunter, you are witnessing a modern day miracle. There goes a dead duck. Okay, now that was better than that. <laughs> that was better than that. What'd you say? <laughs> what? point, yeah, yeah. You got the point. It wasn't a dead duck. He missed. That's what happened. And I think, <laughs> praise God, we all got that. <laughs> all right, praise God. Sometimes the unbelief can even seem more real than the belief itself. I mean, this guy just nonchalantly says, Pastor, there goes a modern day miracle. There goes a flying dead duck. <laughs> you know, because he Say, what he's saying is, I hit it. It's dead, but it's still flying. That's a miracle. <laughs> and that, that reality of the unbelief, okay, uh, actually becomes more real than the belief of that I missed it. And you know why? Because it costs more to admit he missed it. it costs more to his pride cost more to his uh, uh, reputation. He had been carrying on and on and on for years probably about how great he was and there's the pastor standing right there seeing that he missed. Perhaps because it doesn't require any real effort to leave it behind and become something new. Not really. It's, it's like someone believing that flying duck was dead, he would have to actually get off his high horse, the hunter that is, to admit he missed. There's a cost in that. A cost to his pride, a cost to his reputation and all the rest of it, as I just said. Now, our text is kind of like that. Okay? All day long on Easter Sunday, flying ducks... Flying ducks. And as far as everybody was concerned, they're dead. They're not alive. They keep hearing of this Jesus. They hear people say, well, the angels told us that he's alive. And then later, once some people actually come to know that he's alive by meeting him, they still didn't believe that. Remember what the disciples they said? They said it was an idle tale. This is the, this is the most unbelievable chapter in the Bible. This is the most, this is the, this is the chapter in the whole Bible where everybody's living on unbelief. So far. But don't forget, God has a way of turning things around. God has a way of turning people around. Amen? Amen? Many that day were hearing of the resurrection of Jesus, perhaps by angels or maybe someone else or whatever. They didn't believe that. Many ha having even seen him alive, like Mary Magdalene and the women, when they went back to tell the disciples, they had already seen Jesus. They had already talked with him. And uh, in, in two separate occasions, Mary Magdalene was first, and then the women traveling through the countryside. I picture them in the woods. <laughs> I don't know why. But, you know, maybe some trees around and so forth. And all of a sudden, Jesus appears. <laughs> you know? Now they know. Now they know. See, for some reason, just when somebody says it, 
it doesn't have the same power and the same force as someone who has seen him. Someone who has met him. Having seen him alive, but it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. I mean, the story doesn't seem, the whole story doesn't seem to be going anywhere. You know, there's this, you know, angels say about him being alive, other people get to see him, and then they say he's alive, and, and nobody believes. All the rest of them are not believing. Now you understand Mary and the women, they believe, but they didn't believe at first. Mary especially, remember, when she saw the gardener over in the corner, you know, clipping at the bushes and all that, she thought, hey, that's the gardener. No, it wasn't the gardener, it was Jesus. I don't know if he was really clipping at bushes or not, but, you know, she thought he was the gardener. She wasn't believing that was Jesus. He says her name, Mary. And as soon as he says her name, Mary, there's a personal connection that had been lost when he died. It had, it had broken when he died. But now, he's alive. And that connection is restored. Amen? Alright. I mean, it just doesn't seem like the story's really going anywhere. No wonder some people prefer to believe that this was added later, and it wasn't even from Mark. There's no proof of that. Two old manuscripts, two old manuscripts, don't have this part of the story in it. Hundreds of other old manuscripts do. But oh no, we gotta we gotta go with the two that you know don't have it and and make up from that that he you know that the that this part of the story was not in here. You know how one one reason you can know that this, that this is original and this is from Mark, you can know it because nobody in their right mind is going to write up a story like this and and do it against themselves. Here's Mark who's writing this, and all the disciples, you know, they all know him. And um, Mark is believed to be a young friend, probably a teenage boy, of Peter. You know, Peter had to go through all this stuff about finding out if Jesus was real or not, and alive or not, or whatever. But it's just not, wouldn't be normal for somebody to write up a story that makes you look like an idiot. Right? You don't usually do that. I mean, most people go ahead and only tell the parts about where they look pretty smart. They look pretty good. Okay, that's, that's one way you can know. Not only that, the Bible itself says, this is my word. This is my word. There's not stuff added. There's not stuff subtracted. That's a bunch of lunch meat. Amen? Right, Lily? Baloney? Yeah. All right, all right. So everybody is all huddled together now. They're in this upper room. The doors are locked and the windows are locked. There's no way anybody's coming in or out. Okay, they're scared stiff. They realize that the, that the Jewish leaders and the Romans could do to them what they did to Jesus. Why not? And they didn't want to see that happen, so they locked the door and they locked the windows and they just shook in their boots. Sandals. Whatever they had on. Amen? Just waiting for the next shoe or sandal to fall. You've heard that phrase before, right? Just watching for the next shoe to drop. What's going to happen next? There's something missing in this story, people. And I think you've seen it. You may not put a finger on it yet, but you will in a second. There's something missing in this story, and it's this. The rejoicing. The praising. The glory. Amen? The glory. The honor. Lifting up the name of Jesus for His own resurrection. That's all missing. It's replaced by... Sounds like a fairy tale to me called it an old wives tale. Idle tales. Alright? 
Now, is this the way it's supposed to be? No, it is not the way it's supposed to be. It's the way these people reacted to things, but praise God, God in His mercy would not leave them there. It's the same with us. He will not leave us there. Now, we have a choice whether we're going to, you know, listen to what He's saying and believe and, and go on in our, in our belief instead of our unbelief. We still have that choice just like they did. And praise God, they did become believers in the resurrection. But not at first. <laughs> None of them got it. It's not the way it's supposed to be. It's kind of like two sides of the same coin. Okay? It's kind of like that. Kind of like the two sides of the same coin. This is the quote that comes right after what I read to you at the beginning of the service. And this, once again, of course, is A.W. Tozer. Faith and morals are two sides of the same coin. Indeed, the very essence of faith is moral. Any professed faith in Christ as personal Savior that does not bring the life under obedience to Christ as Lord See, because he's Lord and Savior. The Bible says that repeatedly. you got a lot of people saying sinner's prayers and so forth. And a lot of that can be quite fake. Because what do they say? Now I have, you know, accepted instead of received. I, have, I, have, I just have the knowledge now. But I'm not going to follow him. I'm not going to be obedient to him. There are people like that. They'll go ahead and say, yeah, two weeks ago I made this commitment or whatever, but the life doesn't line up. Now maybe someday it will, and that will mean they came into true belief. I understand that, and praise God for it. Yeah, praise God. Rejoice to God. Glory to God. Honor to God. All these things that are missing. When you get rid of the unbelief on any issue, in anything, not just the resurrection. But, well, when you get rid of it, then of course you have a big opportunity to come into the realm of belief, true belief. And it changes the whole thing. So, let me start, start that sentence again. Any professed faith in Christ as personal Savior that does not bring the life under obedience to Christ as Lord that is the obedience, is inadequate and must betray its victim at the last. The man who believes will obey. And see, the lack of obedience is a sign that there's not a true belief going on. And it needs to be much bigger than it is. The man that believes will obey. God gives faith to the obedient heart only. The heart that's not going to be obedient doesn't get faith. Faith comes with obedience. Amen? The, where real repentance is, there is obedience. To escape, and this is a quote from another book, but I'll, I'll give it to you anyway. Like I said, these are all just kind of put in there. But they're, they're by topic, really. To escape the error of salvation by works, we have fallen into the opposite error of salvation without obedience. And that's what a lot of people are saying today. That I don't need the obedience because that would just be legalistic. It's not legalistic. Jesus himself said that, you know, if you believe, you will keep my commandments. Amen? So if there's not a keeping of what Jesus has said, not just the commandments, but you know what, whatever Jesus directs us to, without the keeping of that, there's no obedience. You see? And therefore, no real faith. You may want to, but so you need to get rid of the unbelief and take on the belief. Amen? Take on the belief. Praise God. I mean, this, this is truth. Amen? This is God's holy word. 
You know, I hope she doesn't mind me telling the story, but on the way to church here today, Cindy asked me where her Bible is. And I said, her Bible's in her Bible bag, you know, so you'll have your Bible at church. And she said, good, because you, you, without the Bible there, you don't really know if the pastor's giving you the right thing. <laughs> There's some truth in that, people. Amen? All right. So praise God. That's where becoming a Berean uh, really is all about. Not to show somebody up, not to show somebody wrong. You know, a lot of people do it that way, you know. They'll say, well, I don't agree with this, and I don't agree with that, and I check this out, and it says this, and, you know, and blah, blah, blah. Well, once again, lunch meat. But, you know, the fact is, you know, God's Word is God, God's Word. Let's just believe it. It's, he's worthy of it, all belief. Amen? Amen? Praise the name of Jesus. Praise God. Two sides of the same coin. Two sides of the same coin. To escape the error of salvation by works, we have fallen into the opposite error of salvation without obedience. I remember when we were back at the other church, there was a, I wasn't there, but I heard the story. Um, in, a, in one of the adult Sunday school classes, all of a sudden this one woman said, you know, I don't have to be obedient. Kind of not nice attitude and not, you know, nice voice pattern and everything else, you know. But, you know, I don't have to be obedient. Because they're equating obedience with being legalistic. Well, without true faith and without true belief, which is evidently where she really was, okay, that she's not going to get anywhere with that. Right? So she's decided, I don't have to believe. Well, yes you do. The Bible clearly states, Jesus said, if you believe me, then keep my commandments. You know? If you're going to have faith in me, then you'll do what I say. And you'll want to do what I say. Not legalistically. Legalistically means you've just decided to do it, and you're going to do it whether you like it or not. No! When you have faith in Jesus Christ, you want to do what He says. Praise God. Now, it can take you some time before you get right in there and actually, you know, give up, so to speak, and, and surrender to His Lordship. But it's not just Him being Savior. He is Savior by being Lord. He saves by being your Lord. But people leave that off all the time. I hear it all the time. You know, I accepted Him as my Savior. Without Him being Lord? I don't think so. That all fits together. Amen. From Jesus' own words. Amen? So, there it is right, in the, right there in the Bible. Faith and what is right, they go together. Jesus has to do something about this. He looks at the story developing. He sees the verses. Now, they're not written down yet, but he knows what's going on here. This story is developing, and it's going nowhere, and he knows it. There, yeah, granted, there's a couple of people that believe now because they've seen him, but everybody's got to see him. And I said that before, I'm not relying on your eyeballs to see Jesus because he's up in heaven. The Bible says he sits at the right hand of the Father praying for his church. That's where Jesus is. Amen. The part of the Godhead that's down here is the Holy Spirit living inside his faithful people. Amen? Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Jesus, he, he knows he has to do something about this. He's got to get some more people actually believing and not living in unbelief. Praise God. And it seems like he has already done enough. I mean, if I look at the life of Jesus and what he's accomplished so far, I mean, you know, he suffered, he died, he rose again. You know? I mean, hasn't Jesus done enough? Seems like Jesus has done enough. And yet he looks at the whole story as it's developing and he knows he's got to take it further. And he already knows he will. Because he knows all things. Right? So he knows he's going to take it further. But he's going to do that right now. He's got to do something about this. I think he's done quite a bit. He's risen from the dead. He's done a lot of things for us. Amen? But now it should be the church's turn. You know, the body of Christ to enter into the suffering of Christ. 
believe, if you truly believe in the depths of your hearts that it was for you that that suffering took away your sin, then you're entering into the suffering of Jesus. And that's what the Bible says. That's part of what we must be about in order to truly believe that we know that He did it for us to take away our sin. And we're very grateful for it. Amen? There's also a matter of graciously receiving. Graciously receiving. There's also a matter of repentance and obedience being linked together. Let me, let me show you what I mean. Go to Mark 16. If you're already there, then you've got a head start. Mark 16. Let's just take a look at this verse. Well, let's, let's mold a couple things together here. Glue a couple things together here. I told you before that we're mostly following Mark's gospel. Okay? But, there are gospels that have the account that Mark is using, even though he's greatly shortened. Mark was called by the Holy Spirit to give succinctly the story. Okay? That's why it's the first gospel. And then the other gospels would pick up on all the various stories and give much more detail. We saw that with the two that went on the road to Emmaus. He barely mentions it in Mark, but there are other gospels that go on about that story. Amen? Okay. Alright. Then we come up to a place where they're all in an upper room and they are uh, with each other and they're about to meet Jesus. Now they don't know that yet until he shows up. But they're about to meet Jesus. Now what I did is I took all of the resurrection uh, appearance accounts and I wrote them into the margins. I wrote them into where it would have been if God had called him to use every story. Okay? And quite frankly, Mark never mentions Easter Sunday night. Never mentions Easter Sunday night. The Sunday he's talking about was a week later and it was a time when Thomas would be there. Can I show that to you? Turn over to Luke. Now keep your place. I want to show you that this is not Easter Sunday night. From Mark's Gospel, it looks like it is. Because it flows. It's like Jesus. And then Jesus said, you know, afterward he appeared unto the eleven. You know, it sounds like it's the very next thing. But it's not. Mark is skipping Easter Sunday night and going right to the next week when Thomas was there. Thomas was not there Easter Sunday. At least not when Jesus got into the room. And I'm going to show you that. Turn to Luke, please. Yeah, Luke 24, that's it. Yeah, Luke 24. Now, let's pick it up where we left off last week. Do you remember the two on the road to Emmaus? They had dinner with him. He broke the bread. That's when they recognized who he was. Jesus disappears, takes off for Jerusalem to be with all the others. In the meantime, these two guys are left at the table and they said to each other, did not our heart burn within us as he opened up the scriptures to us on the way as we travel? And I mentioned this before. And I, I can say it again. It's all right. I'm up here. I can say it again. <laughs> uh, the fact is that um, I mentioned this last year. I'm sure I did. Maybe the year before. Uh, did not our heart burn? Now true grammar, true good English grammar, would be did not our hearts burn? Plural. Because they're two people. Okay? But I think it says it this way because now they have the same heart. They had the same heart before in arguing against the resurrection. They were coming against it as they're traveling. And Jesus broke into that and broke into them. Amen? Praise God. And so now they say, did not our heart burn within us? They've got the same heart. They had the same heart before when they weren't believing the resurrection. But now they have the same heart for a very different reason. For a very good reason. Now they do believe in the resurrection. Why? Because they had met Jesus. Amen? They had met Jesus. So I think they hightailed it back to Jerusalem and look at verse 33. Now this we didn't get into last week, but I'll show it to you. 
And they rose up the same hour. This is Luke 24, verse 33. Now watch. And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together. The eleven. Now you know there aren't twelve anymore because Judas betrayed Jesus and didn't repent and ran out and committed suicide. So you know he's gone. So when it says the eleven, that means everybody else. Right? So it says the eleven were gathered. Now watch this. And them that were with them. So there are other people, but the eleven disciples are there. Okay? Including Thomas. See, if Thomas weren't there, there wouldn't be eleven. There would be ten. Right? Now watch. Verse 34, saying, the Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. Now sometime before this all happened, Jesus appeared to Simon. He's back on track. Now watch, verse 35. And they, I almost sound like Charles Stanley, don't I? Because he's always saying that. Watch, watch. <laughs> but that's it's true. Watch this, watch this. And, and they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in the breaking of the bread. So they explained what happened over in Emmaus. Now watch, verse 36. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Now, quite frankly, there's a heading for this section in my Bible, and it says Jesus appears to the ten. Because elsewhere in Scripture, it says clearly that Thomas was not there Easter Sunday night. Up in verse 33, we see that he was. But you get a couple verses further on and he's not. What does that mean? Thomas left. Thomas left when he wasn't supposed to. Thomas left. He had been there, the eleven. It says in verse 33, there were 11. That includes Thomas. There's no other way to see it. But by the time you get to verse 36, Thomas is not there. My heading says that. Jesus appears to the 10. But elsewhere in the other Gospels, it says clearly that Thomas was not there Easter Sunday night. But he was there Easter Sunday night. But he left before Jesus came in. Bad move. Bad timing. Because then he had to go a whole week when the others all knew Jesus was alive. He didn't. Disciples even came to him and said, He appeared to us. We saw him. He, it's real. So you know where Thomas was the next weekend? With everybody else. Praise God for that. Amen? He was with everybody else. He didn't keep running away. Glory to God. He was with everybody else. And that's when Jesus comes into the room and zoom, focuses right on Thomas. Almost like the others aren't even there, almost. And just focuses on Thomas. Thomas, go ahead. Touch my hands. Touch my side. Look at my feet. You can see, I still got the wounds. I have a glorified body, but I kept the wounds. Okay? And... And he looks, and he, it doesn't say he reached out and grabbed them. But I suppose he could have. Uh, but it doesn't say he did. But what it does say is that um, Thomas fell to the ground. And he said, my Lord and my God. He's not just Savior, you see. He's not just Rabbi. Hmm? He's Lord and and Savior. And the Bible repeatedly says it that way. I think there's only one place it says that he's Savior without saying he's Lord. But the vast majority of the other places say Lord and Savior. And notice it doesn't say Savior and Lord. Like I heard one famous evangelist in, in one of his Bible study books, he suggested that, you know, you go ahead and uh, you can accept him as your Savior now and then later, if you want to, you can let him be your Lord. Now, that's not what the Bible says. That's what he says. Okay? The Bible says he's Lord and Savior. He saves by being Lord. Amen. Right? Amen? Okay. So if you look carefully, you can see Thomas was there at first, but left and missed seeing Jesus that Easter Sunday night. Okay? But praise God, he showed up the following week. 
And that's when Jesus said, go ahead, Thomas. Go ahead. And he just, I don't know that he did. I, maybe, maybe not. It doesn't say he did. I'll put it that way. But he was told to. And all the other disciples were told to touch him too. It's not like Thomas was getting special treatment here. Everybody was said, go ahead, here I am, look at me. He even ate uh, broiled fish. Kind of makes you hungry, doesn't it? You know, broiled fish <laughs> and some bread and so forth. He did that to show he's not a ghost. He's not a spirit. He's, he's Jesus. Amen? Praise the name of Jesus. Well, so it was all offered to everybody. Who actually touched him? I don't know. All I know is he said, my Lord and my God. In the Greek, it literally means the Lord of me and the God of me. That's what it means. The Lord of me and the God of me. Pretty specific. Amen? He's not just Savior. He's not just uh, the fixer-upper that straightens out your life. Uh uh He's Lord and He's God. There it is. Praise God. Amen? All right, hold on just a second, Luke 24. Um, I think I'll leave it to your checking it out. Oh, I'll mention it briefly. Well, in fact, I already did some of it. Uh, I'll mention it briefly, but I'll let you check out what happened in Luke 24. You know what I'm saying? We're mostly in Mark, and that's what I wanted to focus on. But you know, it's a good thing to see what happened in Luke, because by that, you find out that Thomas was not there that Easter Sunday night. Okay, so this is the Easter Sunday night thing. He comes into the room. He says, peace be unto you. And they're all terrified. Verse 37. They're terrified. This is Easter Sunday night. Many of them have actually met the Lord. Peter has met the Lord. Mary Magdalene has met the Lord. The other women have met the Lord. But they were terrified. The two on the road to Emmaus, they met the Lord. They came back and told everybody else, He's alive. But they were terrified and they were affrighted and they supposed that they had seen a spirit. Why are you troubled, Jesus said, and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? I'm at verse 39. This is Luke 24, verse 39. Behold my hands and my feet. See? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me. Handle me. It means to touch lightly. Remember what Mary Magdalene was told when she recognized who he was, she grabbed his feet and started worshiping him. And he said, don't do that. Don't do that. I haven't, I haven't ascended up to the Father yet. Save that for later, I guess, could, he could have said. You know. And, and she literally was handling him. I mean, she grabbed a hold of his feet as though to hold him down. She had... She had lost her Jesus once and she wasn't going to lose him again. So she grabs him and Jesus says, don't do that. I got to go see the Father first. The love, the love, the devotion, the dedication, not flip-flopping around and doing whatever he wants to do, or they doing everything they want to do. Uh Uh-uh. No. And now he tells them, he says, handle me. But you know what it means? It means to touch me lightly. In other words, don't don't try to make me into somebody that I'm not. Because in a sense, Mary Magdalene was doing a little bit of that when she grabbed him. She was trying to hold him back. She wanted to keep Jesus for herself. These are not inherently bad things. But Jesus says, not now. Okay? And by the way, he doesn't want anybody trying to make Jesus be what he isn't. Okay? So she gets reprimanded on that. Well, so that's all fine and good. But now he tells him, handle me. Touch me lightly. It's not a molding. It's not a shaping. Okay? But it's a matter to learn his composition. To know for a fact that this is a real man. That Jesus is a human being. Touch me lightly, he said. Go ahead. But don't try to make me into what you want me to be. Contrary to what I am going to be. Alright? So, a spirit does not have flesh and bones. 
And you see that I have them. Now watch. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not, even then they did not believe. For joy, it says. I think what that means is, and you've heard this before, it's too good to be true. I think that's probably what that is. It's too, it's too good to be true. And so they wondered. And he said unto them, Do you have any meat? Do you have any fish? It's the same word he, he asked them when they were out on the lake and fishing. You know. Do you have any meat? Fish. And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb. And he took it and he did eat before them. <laughs> he ate before them. Proving that he was the resurrected Lord. Amen? And then it says in verse 45, and he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. That was Easter Sunday night and Thomas blew it. Thomas was not there. Praise God. After the disciples told him what he missed, he shows up. And that's what this is. Because I know that for a fact. Because look at it. It says, and this is verse 14. 16, 14. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven that sat at meat. This is the following weekend. When there were eleven present. Right? Thomas is back. So now it's not ten. This is the second weekend that he started. He just skipped right over the, the Easter Sunday night. Just didn't cover it. Not because he didn't want to, because God showed him what to cover. It was God inspired. This whole book is God inspired. There's been nothing added to this or subtracted to make it different than God intended. Praise God. Amen? And they sat at meat, watch, and upbraided them <laughs> with their unbelief and their hardness of heart. Upbraided them. You know what I picture? This upbraided, I'll tell you what it means first. Uh, upbraided means he defamed them, he railed at them, he chided at them, he taunted them. It comes from the Greek word for disgrace. He disgraced them. You might say, well that's not very nice. Jesus, don't you should have been kind, shouldn't you have been kinder? You know, and all that. Uh, I think Jesus knows what he's doing. He's got to break their unbelief. He's got to break that unbelief. And he's got to do it now. Because they're seeing him. Amen? Okay? So he upbraided them. Uh, strong word. Very strong word. Alright? You know what I pictured? Uh, upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart. Two things. Unbelief and hardness of heart. I just picture this intertwined thing. And it becomes like a, a rope. Okay? Another way to picture it, uh, well, when I say rope, uh, you know what that reminds me of? Doesn't it remind you of the whip that Jesus fashioned when he was going to cleanse the temple and get rid of the money changers and all of that false stuff? Kind of sounds like it, doesn't it? It's not the same thing, but he's really getting after them. He's whipping them. He's whipping them with their own unbelief and their slowness, hardness of heart. Because what? Because they believed not them which had seen him after he had risen. Now Jesus is getting very specific. He expected them to believe by, you know, being told by the angels or have the women say the angels said he's alive. I mean, that should do it, but it didn't for everybody. Okay? They, it, they had to see him. Not with physical, well, in their case, yeah, with physical eyes. But in our case, Jesus said we are even more blessed. Those that can, can know Him and see Him that don't have the physical eyes trained on Him. In other words, Christians in the future, when Jesus isn't here on earth anymore, they're more blessed. We're more blessed than they were. Because we can believe without physically seeing Him eyeball to eyeball. Right? Amen? Well, here it is. Because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Jesus stepped it up a notch and said, You guys have to believe because you have seen me. Not just heard of me. 
you have seen me. So he takes this, I don't know, I picture the old story about taking up the two by four, right? And whapping the mule on the side of the head just to get his attention. Right? You know, the old story about that. Just to get his attention. So I picture this two by four and whack. Okay? Wake him up a little bit. And that's what it is. He upbraided them. He defamed them. He railed at them. He chided them. Um, to taunt them even. And uh, like I say, it comes from the from the word for disgrace. He disgraced them. Really got after them. Okay? And this unbelief that they had, it's faithlessness. It is being in want of Christian faith. It is, it, it's disobedience. It's uncertainty. It's distrust. It's lack of acknowledgement of Christ. These are all definitions. I'm just giving the whole list of definitions of this Greek word. Okay? Um, Just really getting after them. Um, they believed not. They believed not. Remember? To entrust one's spiritual well-being to Christ. That's belief. So to not entrust one's spiritual well-being to Christ is unbelief. Amen? And, and you can say, well, I believe. You know? Well, what did the guy say when he came down from the mountain and Jesus was transfigured? What did the guy say? The guy who had the, the kid that was demon-possessed. He said, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. In other words, deal with what's left in me by way of unbelief. Get rid of it and fill me up with belief in you. Praise the name of Jesus. Amen? <laughs> There you go. There you go. Praise God. Praise God. Thomas was there the next week. <laughs> the second week. I don't think he missed after that. I don't think he threw it away after that. You know? In fact, he became one of the prominent disciples. He traveled off to India. Started churches. Was martyred there. Killed there. By the uh, Hindus. Not wanting to hear about Jesus. You know, a lot of people don't want to hear about Jesus. A lot of people don't want to hear the whole gospel about Jesus. You know, yes, the positive side, which is, which is all, you know, justification by faith and, you know, belief and all of this kind of thing. But, you know, there are plenty of warnings in there too. Plenty of warnings. In fact, I told you earlier that every promise of God is a warning. Right? Because if He promises something and then you don't go His way, then it's obviously going to turn into a pretty serious warning. Do you, do you see Jesus' problem with getting His church off the ground? <laughs> Have you seen it yet? I mean, out of all these places of unbelief, and then finally they come into it. Have you seen His problem with getting the church off the ground? And what about also keeping it off the ground? That means keeping it flying. Keeping it moving forward. With all the other things that could drag it down. Flying high with true belief, praise God. No longer weighed down by the dead weight of unbelief. Amen? And dead ducks are never, ever going to fly. Amen? Amen? Praise the name of Jesus. And if we just go wander through this life like a bunch of dead ducks, <laughs> you know, we're not going to end up flying either. So praise God. To ask Him, get rid of this unbelief. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. And when He grabs a hold of that, and turns it all into true belief. Praise God. Away we go. Amen. Don't have to worry about some plane coming in, you know, and messing up your approach on the runway and all these things that happen in real life and collisions on the, at the airport or up in the sky or any of these kind of things. You don't have to worry about any of that. Because it's Jesus who is flying the plane. Amen? <laughs> Praise God. It's Jesus who is flying the plane. Hallelujah. And uh, we're... I like. We're kind of there with him, but, you know, I really, I guess I really don't like that bumper sticker that says, you know, he's my co-pilot or something like that. No, no, no. He's the pilot. 
we're on the plane for the ride. <laughs> okay? And when he says, do this, do this, you know, he's got a reason for it, people. He's got a reason. It's not legalism. He's not trying to make you purchase your salvation. No. But if you're truly saved, you want to be about what he says. Amen? Two sides. Two sides to the same coin. Amen? That coin that Lily has, you know, with the angel on one side and the angel on the other side. I don't care how many times you flip that thing up in the air, it's going to come up angels. You know? Oh, they say occasionally, once in a blue moon, a coin can land on its edge. I've never seen that. <laughs> Unless you put some super glue on the edge or something, you know. <laughs> I guess I've never seen that. Well, anyway, I think it's going to come up angels. Amen? <laughs> Praise the name of Jesus. It's angels that started this whole thing, right? It's angels that told them, He is alive. He is risen. But it's got to go beyond the angel. Amen? It's got to go beyond the angel. We need to see Him, embrace Him, love Him, and let Him be Lord as well as Savior. Praise God. Amen? Right? Okay. Praise God. Father, we, we want to thank You, Lord, for... Whenever you give your truth, we want to thank you, Lord, that if it's given by your Spirit, then it's always going to be true. And we don't have to try to figure out something else. We don't have to debate it. We don't have to come up with, well, I think. A lot of people running around with a, well, I think. No, it's not what we think. It's what you say. That's why we turn to your Word. That's why we look at, look at this in, in detail. We thank you, Lord, because you are the one who will lead the way. You, you don't desire anybody to perish. It doesn't mean people won't choose to go off in a, in a uh, Christless eternity. But, you know, you don't desire that. You don't want anybody to perish, the scripture says. And so I pray, dear God, grab a hold of hearts. Grab a hold of hearts, dear God, and uh, manifest yourself. Reveal yourself. And you, dear God, will have all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen.